Good evening and welcome to the first meeting of the Linnaean Society's 2022-2023 season. I hope all of you have had some sort of in-town or out-of-town adventure this summer and are already enjoying the fall. And now I'll call the meeting to order. As you may have noticed, we are still on Zoom as we wait for the American Museum of Natural History to give us the green light. However, there is a small chance we will gather in person once again this season, so please continue to check our website and communications for updates. In the meantime, join us on a walk. If you are beginning or expert birder who likes our company, we still have spots open on our September 24th family walk, which will be, among other things, stroller path friendly. We also have room on a no question is too small walk on September 25th. Both walks will cover Central Park's North End, an area I'm most fond of. Check our website to register. Tonight, we bring you a slightly experimental format that may challenge the capacity of NYC internet services. Our speaker, Dr. Elizabeth Carlin, just happened to be in town and was, it was in need of a secure internet connection. Therefore, Dr. Carlin, Vice President Willow, and I thought it'd be fun to gather together under one roof for tonight's lecture. You can look forward to some seat changing and camera switching that will hopefully make my apartment look way bigger than it is. As always, we've disabled the chat feature, so if you have a question, please type it into the Q&A box. Our Vice President Gabriel Willow will answer your questions at the conclusion of the lecture. And to streamline things this evening, our Vice President will also adjourn the meeting. On to business. Thank you to everyone who submitted votes on the items listed in last week's President's letter. Motion number one, congratulations to Debbie Becker, who has been voted in as our new board member. Debbie has been part of the boarding committee for many, many years, and I'm very excited to have her join Linnean leadership. Motion number two, to accept the following members of the Linnaean study passed unanimously with 138 in favor and zero opposed. Before I name the new members and sponsors, I just wanna let you know that I do practice your name several times in the days prior to reading them aloud in hopes that I get them right. Padma Beatty and Athen, sponsored by Chuck McAlexander. Judy Honig, sponsored by Renee Lussier. John Hartzell, sponsored by Kathleen Howley. Meryl Greenblatt, sponsored by Mary Beth Cooper. Christina Black, sponsored by Amanda Bielskis. Karen Yeager, sponsored by Amy Simmons. Suzanne Zwicky, sponsored by Debbie Mullins. Neil Markowitz, sponsored by yours truly. Lucy Oakley, sponsored by Ken Chea. Laura Clark, sponsored by Kevin Sisko. Patricia Lindsay, sponsored by Mary Normandia. Shaibal Mitra, sponsored by Mary Normandia. Charlotte Levitt, sponsored by Kathleen Matthews. Alex Levitt, sponsored by Kathleen Matthews. Judd Feldman Santos, sponsored by Evan Huang. Linda Freeman, sponsored by Mary Beth Cooper. Roberta Kravitz, sponsored by Elise Bozier. Andrea Zuckerman, sponsored by Kristen Ellington. Welcome to our newly elected members. If anyone out there is looking to become a member tonight, please visit our website, LinnaeanNewYork.org. Motion three to accept the May 2022 minutes, meeting minutes also passed with 136 in favor and zero opposed. For local NYC members who are tuning in tonight, I want to remind you that our annual homecoming picnic has been rescheduled to this coming Sunday, September 18th from 1230 to 330. Guests of members are also welcome to attend and we hope that any non-members who attend will be inspired to join the society. We are also excited that we finally have LSNY ball caps in stock. Please reach out to our secretary, Debbie Mullins, if you're interested in purchasing one. And now, I have the honor of introducing Dr. Elizabeth Carlin. Dr. Carlin is a National Science Foundation and Living Earth Collaborative Postdoctoral Fellow at Washington University in St. Louis, where her research focuses on the impacts of urbanization on Eastern gray squirrels. Dr. Carlin received a PhD in biological sciences from Fordham University, where she worked on the evolutionary ecology of urban pigeons. Her dissertation work was featured on Saturday Night Live and written about in Wired Magazine. This led the New York Times to refer to her as the pigeon stalker. In addition to her research, she is co-founder and editor of the Urban Evolution blog, Life in the City, Evolution in an Urbanizing World. Tonight, from my own living room, she will present, from the ground up, how urbanization shapes the evolution of squirrels and pigeons. Take it away, Dr. Carlin. Thank you so much for having me. Um, we're going to see if we can share my screen. Um, and then... Hopefully that is looking okay. Can we, can someone confirm, Rochelle, can you confirm that you can see my screen? Yeah, we can see it. Great. Um, so thank you so much for having me. I'm Liz Carlin. Um, I use she, her pronouns. And we're presenting from a keynote today, which is a change for me. So hopefully things work. Um, but I'm really excited to tell you about my dissertation research and the research that I've been doing since I left New York. So as you know, urbanization is drastically increasing around the globe. And with this comes massive changes in the surrounding environment as it's converted from natural to an anthropogenic environment. 
Here we see Shanghai developing over 30 years, and we see this connection of kind of different downtown centers. We see a pushing out of the land into the water, this actual creation of new land. And we can imagine that this is happening all over the globe in cities. And with this uh, kind of increase in urbanization, we see all these changes to the landscape. For example, we see increased habitat fragmentation here in San Francisco. You can see that Golden Gate Park and the Presidio are very detached from each other. We see that there is increased buildings and roads we see that there's increased air, noise, and light pollution, and just this increase in environmental toxins. And along with these massive landscape and environmental changes, we get this new ecosystem that has novel selection pressures and barriers to gene flow. And the ecology of this urban environment drives evolution, which then in turn influences the ecology in this constant feedback system. So, I would implore you to kind of think about urban systems as a type of landscape. Of course, these are complicated because urban systems are built on top of other landscapes. And so they're not all equal. Denver is obviously very different from Miami as those two are built, those two cities are built upon very different ecosystems. And urban evolution is this incredibly new field. And so actually, when I was getting my undergraduate degree, this field did not exist. And it's only really since the mid 1990s, as we can see here, until recently, that urban evolution studies started to become popularized and started to be conducted. Um, for a long time, we thought of cities as these unnatural spaces, or that evolution wasn't rapid enough to keep up with the constant change. And we've really kind of disproved that recently. So there have been urban evolution studies on a variety of taxa around the world, and they mainly look at one or a few cities to compare evolutionary phenomenon. So here in this slide, we're seeing in black silhouettes of the organisms that have been studied. And in blue, we see these human commensals that have been studied, each with a colored dot representing a city and the size of the dot representing how many people are living in that city. And these studies have focused on a variety of evolutionary phenomenon, including morphological changes, physiological changes, behavioral changes, gene flow, drift, some of which I'll talk to you about today. For example, researchers have shown that urban birds are diverged at the CERT gene, which is associated with harm avoidance behavior. And it this research showed that behavioral changes are likely to occur in urban areas using a candidate gene approach. My friend, Kristen Winchell, who's actually a new professor at NYU in the biology department, just starting last month, showed that lizards in Puerto Rico have longer legs and stickier feet that allow them to move more easily on urban substrates. Why might they have longer legs? Well, I want you to imagine me at 5'4", racing against a basketball court against someone like Michael Jordan, who's so much taller than me. He can take less steps to move across that basketball court than I can. And because of that, he can get to that refuge a lot faster if it's that making that basket. Well, lizards are the same and their refugia are trees. So if they're trying to transverse the grass in between the trees, the longer legs help them move across the space a lot more quickly. Now, why might they have stickier feet? Well, you can imagine that urban substrates are very different than the substrates that we find in the forest where these lizards normally occur. And so here we're seeing a lizard on a painted um, metal dumpster. And you can imagine trying to crawl up that dumpster is very difficult if you're used to crawling up the bark of trees. And so these uh, re researchers, Kristen has shown, Dr. Winchell has shown that that these lizards actually have more lamellae on their feet that allow them to cling to these smoother urban surfaces. And then my PhD advisor uh, showed that white-footed mice, which are a native mice found throughout uh, the Northeast, 
He showed that these white-footed mice in New York City parks diverged into separate forms that are genetically distinct. So you can actually give him a mouse from Prospect Park and Central Park, and he can tell you, even if you haven't labeled where they're from, he can tell you what park they're from because they've diverged so much that their genetics are distinct to that park. Now, these kind of last studies provide example of, um, or Kristen's study provides this example of non-adaptive evolution in which gene flow and genetic drift, sorry, let me rephrase that. This last study about that Jason showed about white-footed mice provide an example of non-adaptive evolution in which gene flow and genetic drift work to counter each other with gene, with gene flow homogenizing allelic variation and genetic drift really working to differentiate allelic variation. And these are non-adaptive processes. And so I want to kind of be very clear that how, like a lot of what we study in evolutionary biology is non-adaptive processes, just not neutral evolution that is occurring kind of in the background due to these random forces of genetic drift. And we've seen um, the effects of drift on genetic structure populations that are dispersed across the urban landscape. For example, researchers showed that bobcats that live in urban areas um, specifically the building of freeways here in Southern California, like the 405 and the 101, lead to genetic drift and population differentiation. In this image, each circle represents an individual bobcat sampling location, and the color corresponds with the predominant dominant structure or really the ancestry cluster for each individual. So you can see that the 405 really is kind of dividing the population into these this yellow group and the purple group. And then the 101 is dividing the population into a green and red group and another purple group or this purple group. However, my colleague showed that black widow spiders are actually facilitated um, by urbanization. So this might be kind of counterproductive. We think of urbanization as kind of breaking apart the substrate and making it difficult for animals to cross. But black widow spiders are building their webs underneath cars and in wheel wells. And then we as humans are driving in between these cities. And so we're actually facilitating their dispersal. And black widow spiders in cities across the Southwest uh, are really similar to each other. And more similar to each other, the cities, black widow spiders in cities are more similar to each other than they are to the nearby rural areas because of that facilitation of car travel. Now, human commensals, which we saw in the previous slide silhouetted in blue, are species that live in close association with and benefit from humans. Often these organisms are so integrated into our cities that we don't even notice them. And most urban evolution studies thus far have really focused on native organisms. And I'm gonna argue that there's actually a lot to learn from organisms like human commensals that not only persist, but really thrive in these urban areas. But of course, our understanding of spatial genetic patterns of human commensals is really dependent on each organism and their relationship with humans. So researchers have shown that German cockroaches, which are one example of this human commensal, that genetic differentiation increases with spatial scale, being the lowest within buildings. So you might find a whole kind of all the cockroaches within your building are really, really related to each other. And then as you move away from your building within the city and then across the US and then across continents, we're seeing greater and greater differentiation. On the island of Manhattan, where many of us are right now, uh, in New York, my academic sibling, Dr. Matt Combs, showed that brown rats, another human commensal, those rats that we're seeing on the subway um, and in our, in our trash, these rats have limited dispersal leading to an uptown and downtown genetic cluster. And Matt proposes that this is likely because of the lack of trash on the weekends in the midtown area. But so we know that spatial scale is really important and needs to take into account life history strategies. 
And we all know that pigeons are super capable of flying long distances. And there's stories of pigeons heroically being, bringing messages back to bases during World War II and World War I. However, GPS studies have shown that pigeons are really only traveling about half a kilometer from their home roost, because why would you leave home when you have food and a nest and plenty of mates? So with pigeons, I'm, in my dissertation, I'm asking, will we see similar genetic patterns to those observed in cockroaches where there's high similarity among individuals in a shared geographic location, or rats where there's these distinct genetic clusters, or will we see something totally different? Now, I know y'all are New Yorkers and you're totally familiar with pigeons, but I want to give you a little bit more background. Pigeons are native to Asia, North Africa, and Southern Europe, where they live on rocky cliffs. They were domesticated around five to 10,000 years ago, originally as the food source. But as other poultry became more popular, they began to be bred for their racing and show traits. So here you can see a pigeon with curly feathers. This is a type of show pigeon. Um, and people still show pigeons like people show dogs. There are big competitions with big uh, prize money for having the prettiest pigeon. Pigeons are known for their long distance flight and their ability to return to their home loft. And they also have this incredibly rapid reproduction and fast population turnover. They can produce offspring approximately every six weeks. And pigeons have been used as a model of evolution from helping Darwin understand selection to more recently researchers at the University of Utah that are working on determined determining which specific genes underlie specific traits like these curly feathers. And despite all of that, that long history, there really hasn't been a lot of work done on pigeon population genetics. A study in Europe showed that genetic distance increases with geographic distance and inbreeding within a flock might be common. And on average, pigeons are making about a 590 meter uh, flight from their home roost, so they're really not going very far. In Singapore, researchers found that pigeons form a single genetic cluster, but it's unclear if this is because of the recent introduction of pigeons. Pigeons were introduced into Singapore in the 1960s into the botanical gardens there, or if because Singapore is a highly urbanized island that's kind of disconnected from other things. So maybe the pigeons aren't leaving the island. So for my the first chapter of my dissertation, I asked how do gene flow and genetic drift structure the feral pigeon population in the northeastern megacity? Now, as East Coasters, you're probably familiar with the Northeastern megacity. This runs from Boston down to Washington, DC, kind of the I-95 corridor. And this area covers less than 2% of the nation's land area, but contains 52 million residents, or about 17% of the US population, making it the most heavily urbanized area in the United States. And most urban evolution studies thus far have really focused on a single city or done comparisons among a few cities. But animals obviously don't respect political boundaries and the extent of urbanization throughout the Northeast, along with the dispersal ability of pigeons makes the Northeastern megacity this really interesting case study for urban evolution. Now, I want you to kind of see here, we have each kind of clustered city you can see with the amount of impervious surface in red, apologies if you are colorblind, um, but this is the normal map for impervious surface that we're given. Um, and you can see that kind of each city is clustered on its own, kind of forming this archipelago of cities in an island chain. But when we look at the same area at night, we see the massive amount of connectivity among these cities. So from Washington DC all the way up through New York, we get almost solid light at night or urbanization. We get a slight break in Connecticut before moving into Providence and Boston, which are another for, which again form another mega city. So this kind of structured how I might think about spatial population genetics models and led me to think about these pigeon populations in a few ways. One, we might see panmixia where pigeons in every city are mating with everybody else and they're just moving all among these cities. 
We might see something like isolation by distance where pigeons are mating with individuals in their nearest cities. But because of that, we get differentiation in the population um, across long distances. Or we might get something like isolation by barrier. Now, thinking back, back to those bobcats, we remember that the freeways act as, acted as a barrier for those bobcat populations. But here with pigeons, we might want to kind of flip that on our heads and think about how green space might actually act as a barrier to these pigeon populations, because we don't really see pigeons in heavily forested areas. So I spent years driving up all across the uh, I-95 corridor and collected pigeons from each of these cities, each of these six major cities. And I ended up with a sample size of 473 individuals across this space. To collect these pigeons, I would go to each city and drive around until I saw pigeons um, and then drop food on the ground and use a net gun, as you can see here, to capture those pigeons. This is a non-harmful technique. It's a, a live capture method where the pigeons are caught in a net, and then I can quickly take them out of the net and put them in an individual plastic or paper bag where I can then process them and let them go. Now you can see that within this flock, a bunch of individuals escaped, but we still got 10 individuals in this net, which is more than what we needed for this sample location. So once I've collected those pigeons, I collect blood for DNA analysis. Pigeons have great nucleated blood, unlike mammals, which makes it a great resource for us. I can take a tiny little bit of blood and then band that bird so I know that I've already captured it and let it go. I then did DDRAD sequencing. And DDRAD is reduced representation genome sequencing. Basically, what I want you to understand is we take enzymes to chop up the genome so we can extract thousands of small regions, which we can look at relatedness of individuals. This method, I have a feeling, will actually go out of style pretty soon as we move to whole genome sequencing techniques, which is pretty exciting. We then used these uh, segments of DNA to look for single nucleotide polymorphisms or differences in the DNA. So as you can see here, the two, uh, the purple and the blue individual both have C at this specific location, and the green individual has an A at this location. What that's telling me is that the purple and the blue individual are more likely to be related to each other, and that the individual that's green is uh, one step removed from those individuals. So we basically use computer algorithms to compute all this information to detect those single nucleotide polymorphisms and then analyze them. In all across the entire pigeon genome, which is about 1.2 uh, gigabases, uh, we found 35,200 SNPs. So a lot of information for us to be able to work with in our analysis. So what did I find? First, looking at relatedness, um, I want to show you a Mantel correlogram. And I know this can be super intimidating, but basically I want you to look across the x-axis at distance. So we have distance in kilometers and then just a measure of relatedness, right? So you're going to be highly related to your identical twin, and you're going to share 50% of your genome with your um, parents, with each parent. So that's what this, this relatedness measure is. So, uh, and a correlogram is a graph in which spatial correlation values are plotted as a function of geographic distance. So that's what you're seeing each plot point here. And what this told me was pigeons within a 50 kilometer radius are really highly related to each other, but at distances beyond 50 kilometers, pigeons were really kind of unlikely to be related. Okay, so that tells me that maybe pigeons aren't really moving out of the city, which has that kind of 50 kilometer radius. So then I needed to do another type of analysis to look at relatedness among cities. We ran admixture. And in this plot, each individual bar right here represents one of those 473 individuals in my sample size. And the color represents 
the genetic cluster assigned to each individual in each individual displayed as a proportion of ancestry. So basically you can think of this as a red group and a blue group. And uh, we ran this at a bunch of different numbers of populations. If it, did we see any patterns at three, if we force the data into three groups or 15 groups. And we found that our data was most well supported by these two groups, this red group and this blue group. And what this is showing me is that pigeons from Washington, DC, all the way up through New York City are really one population. And that pigeons in Boston and Providence are another population. So that leads me to think about this isolation by barrier method that we had kind of proposed early on. And why might we be seeing that? It looks like my slide isn't showing, but we'll get, we'll get there. Um, we're also seeing something similar in a DAPC. Again, I don't wanna to get too much into the weeds with this, but if you look across the X axis, what we're seeing is differentiation. We're trying to really pull these um, groups apart. And so our X axis, which accounts for the most differentiation, we're seeing Providence and Boston really pull out as separate from everything over here on the left-hand side of the graph. And then if we look along the y-axis, we get some more differentiation between Philadelphia and New York kind of clustering together and Washington and DC and Baltimore clustering together. And so this is really kind of telling me that something is going on here, possibly across Connecticut, that's much more suburban, where we're possibly preventing gene flow of these pigeon populations. So kind of big takeaways from this are most pigeons are moving, um, not moving outside the city. But because a few individuals disperse, we're seeing this unrestricted gene flow between most cities. Again, most notably between Washington, D.C. and New York City with the Boston Providence pigeons being kind of separate. And this suburbanization across Connecticut may act as a barrier to gene flow. Now, I want to take you guys onto kind of a behavioral study um, that's one of the favorite studies that I got to do during my dissertation, mostly because I know every single person listening right now has done this study probably multiple times. You just didn't realize that you were doing a scientific study. So I looked at flight initiation distance. And flight initiation distance is a super common measure used to assess wariness and risk. And it's defined as the distance at which an escape response is initiated between a threatening stimulus and an animal. But basically, this is just me walking at pigeons to assess if they're avoiding me as a threat or continuing to do a behavior that increases fitness, such as foraging or mating or parental care. So we predict that flight initiation distance should decrease as perceived threats decrease, right? So as the pigeon sees me as less threatening, I should be able to more closely approach the pigeon. And we looked at this relationship among, of FID among landscape features and predator community. And I want to shout out to my student who was an undergraduate at uh, Columbia. At the time this research was conducted, his name is Richard Lai, and he's now a graduate student at Yale University. So to kind of demonstrate what he did was he went all across New York City and walked towards pigeons until they flew away. And that flight response might be the pigeon actually flying away or could be the pigeon just walking away. As we normally see, the pigeons aren't going to exert a lot of energy to necessarily fly away if they don't see you as a big threat. We repeated this experiment 519 times all across the city. And then we looked at our, we used these data to look at a bunch of different variables. Now, as New Yorkers, as the New York Linnaean Society, uh, you all probably know this, but this is an incredibly heterogeneous landscape, right? We have these forests in Prospect Park and open fields in Central Park and tall buildings in Times Square and tons of pavement. 
We have paths and grass and trees in St. John Cemetery and typical suburban houses with backyards out in Jamaica. And so this landscape is incredibly diverse across the city. And so we thought that would be interesting to explore in relationship to how close you can get to pigeons. But because landscape is an incredibly com complicated variable and is very connected, the number of roads is connected to the amount of impervious surface and how many trees there are, because if there's lots of impervious surface, you're not going to have a forest. So we used um, a principal component analysis to reduce the dimensionality of our data. And Basically, what I want you to understand from this is that both color and size of the circle indicate how the variable is associated with each principal component. So focusing just on impervious surface, we see that PC1 is positively associated with impervious surface. PC2 is negatively, very strongly negatively associated with impervious surface. PC3 isn't really associated with impervious surface at all. And PC4 is slightly associated. And we repeated this for canopy cover, developed low intensity, open green space, forest, herbaceous land cover, water, road length. Um, these are all publicly available databases and we're really lucky that New York City has such detailed landscape maps. We then ran a model that incorporated all of these um, principal component analyses along with pedestrian traffic, which again, I'm so thankful that New York City kind of produces these types of data, as well as human population density from the US census. I, put, I used a 590 meter buffer around each observation point based on how much we knew that pigeons were flying, and then put these into a linear model to determine the most well-supported support, model. And I found that you can, as expected, get closer to a pigeon in areas where most people live, you can get closer to a pigeon in areas with more pedestrians. And you can get closer to pigeons in areas associated with PC2, which represented more impervious surface, more roads, and less canopy cover. So that's something that you probably would predict based on your own experiments doing this uh, with pigeons across New York City. But the next thing that we did was look at a predator model. So we know that pigeons aren't just responding to us as humans, but are also responding to the predators that the natural predators that are in the area. But because raptor occurrences are relatively low and super time consuming to collect, I turned to community science data collected using the eBird app. Since I only wanted to understand if there was a correlation with predator sightings, meaning abundance and presence, I used counts of raptor sightings within that 900, 590 meter radius of each FID observation. And then similar to my landscape model, I ran a backward stepwise model to determine which model best fit my data. And what I and within this, I added Cooper's hawks, red tail hawks, and peregrine falcons, which are all known to feed on pigeons during the day when pigeons are most active. Uh, and what I found was that Cooper's hawks sightings had no influence on flight initiation distance. But red tail hawk sightings, we found that flight initiation distance increases as red tail hawk sightings increase. But opposite of that, flight initiation distance decreases as peregrine falcon sightings increase. So what's going on? Why are we getting these two separate responses from these different predators being around? I was super confused and actually ended up reaching out to a lot of my birder friends who pointed me to how these two types of predators feed. And so if you're thinking about how these two predators are feeding, we're seeing that peregrine falcons are hunting in the air. So here we have a video of a pigeon flying and a peregrine falcon is gonna come in and grab that pigeon out of the air. And so maybe it's within the pigeon's best interest to allow humans, which are less of a threat than this peregrine falcon, to allow humans to get closer to, that, to them instead of exerting energy that could make them fly off and be vulnerable to a peregrine falcon. On the other hand, 
red-tailed hawks have a much different hunting strategy. So here you can see a red-tailed hawk coming in and grabbing a pigeon off the ground. And I've had this happen to me just walking around Washington Square Park. These um, red-tailed hawks will come in and swoop down very, very close to humans. And let's see, there we go. Another kind of New York City moment. We have this, uh, this red-tailed hawk jumping on this pigeon that unfortunately got stuck in this balcony. And then these red-tailed hawks are also very, very comfortable feeding around humans. So apologies if this is too grotesque for you, but we are a naturalist society and this is nature. Um, this red-tailed hawk is, is feeding on a pigeon that it caught. If I had the sound on this video, you could hear the normal New York City sounds of ambulances and fire trucks and police cars and honking and just all that city noise. And this red-tailed hawk does not care um, and is going about eating its meal. Very, very different than these peregrine falcons. So possibly what's going on here is that the predators, the pigeons are assessing, are humans a risk, but also what are the predators in this area and how much of a risk are they to me? And calculating all of that when making their decisions about if they should escape and when they should escape. So kind of broadly, you can get closer to pigeons in areas with higher population density, higher pedestrian density, and more impervious surface cover and roads and less tree canopy cover. And you can get closer to pigeons in areas with higher peregrine falcon sightings and fewer red-tailed hawk sightings. So this is what I did for my dissertation, some of what I did for my dissertation. And basically, uh, what does this tell us about urban evolution? Urban landscape heterogeneity may contribute to spatial and genetic patterns across a single city. So we really need to examine patterns at different spatial scales. We know that organisms depend on that depend on humans exhibit fine scale spatial genetic structure that reflect human patterns and distributions. And then we really, therefore, we really need to sample more across urban areas. And also not all cities are equal. We really must, or must understand the historic ongoing interactions that may be taking place within a city. And this brings me to my postdoctoral research, which is really on kind of understanding squirrels in St. Louis and environmental racism. For those of you not familiar, environmental racism is a concept in the environmental justice movement, which developed in the United States throughout the 70s and 80s. And the term is used to describe um, environmental injustice that occurs when a, in a racialized contest, both in practice and policy. In the United States, environmental racism criticizes inequities between urban and ex-urban areas after white flight. And this term was coined by Dr. Ben Chavez, who says environmental racism is the racial discrimination in environmental policymaking, the enforcement of regulations and laws, the deliberate targeting of communities of color for toxic waste facilities, the official sanctioning of life threatening presence of poisons and pollutants in black communities, and the history of excluding people of color from the leadership of ecology movements. And so after I finished up my dissertation in New York City and the Northeast, I moved to St. Louis, Missouri. St. Louis, Missouri sits near the confluence of the Mississippi and Missouri rivers, and the city proper has about 300,000 people in it, with, while the metro area contains about 2.8 million. This is really a shrinking city, as you'll be able to see in some of the pictures that I show in a bit. For a long time, this area was a regional center of the Native American Mississippian culture and the Cahokia mounds that were active from 900 to 1500. Um, 1500. Uh, and these, this area was at the time on par with modern day London and Paris. There was really this huge amount of people living in this Mississippi Valley um, and using that land. And um, from 1870 to 1920, St. Louis was the fourth largest city in the country. You might not 
imagine that now, but it was. Um, and industrial production was incredibly important to St. Louis in the 1800. Major corporations such as Anheuser-Busch um, and Purina and the Consolidated Lead Company have all, as well as several automobiles, have all had factories that are contributing to the pollutants in St. Louis, as well as the Mississippi River being right there, which is a great place if you're a big factory to dump all your waste. Now, Mississippi uh, was a, a slave state and has an incredible history, um, incredibly frustrating history of racial segregation. To see that, here we have the Del Mar Divide, which is a road that runs across St. Louis, dividing the North and the South, and two census tracts right butting up against each other on different sides of Del Mar, this, this street that cuts St. Louis in half. We see on the North side, the medium home value in home value is $78,000, the median income is $22,000, and 5% of the population has a bachelor's degree. Right across the street, the census tract on the other side of Del Mar has a median home value of $310,000, a median income of $47,000, and a population with bachelor's degree at 67%. So very, very drastic differences across St. Louis. And what I wanna show you is how segregated St. Louis here is. Here you're looking at a racial dot map where each dot represents a single person and the dot is colored based on that person, person's ethnicity. So we see in the North is mainly where the black population is living. And in the South is where the white population is living. This big white patch right here is Forest Park. This is where the 1904 World's Fair took place um, and is very comparable to um, Central Park uh, with some exceptions. This park uh, is clearly in the white neighborhood and has two golf courses, 18 tennis courts, but zero basketball courts and was very much developed for the white population in St. Louis. To kind of show you about the environmental differences that we're getting that are corresponding with this racism, I want you to look at this lead level map. And again, I wanna, I wanna direct you to this line that's the Del Mar divide that's really dividing um, those two populations. And we see that here again in this lead level map with the amount of lead level poisoning in children really corresponding um, to those black neighborhoods, likely because soil remediation hasn't occurred in these areas. To give you an idea of what the landscape looks like, I've spent a lot of time driving around South St. Louis and North St. Louis, and the differences are incredibly noticeable. So, Unlike New York City, we actually put our trash in dumpsters behind the houses. And in South St. Louis, that's predominantly white, we have these clean alleyways, the dumpsters are emptied, they're not overflowing, and in general, trash is picked up. But this is what it looks like on the north side. And there's tons of illegal, illegal dumping that's occurring, people coming in from outside of St. Louis City to dump in the city because it's cheaper. These dumpsters are not being picked up very frequently by the sanitation department and thus they're overflowing. And so kind of thinking about these landscape differences that are shaped by racism, we know that difference, we can see differences in garbage pickup based on these different neighborhoods. We see differences in housing, it's kind of, I don't know, hard to think about after being in New York City, but there's tons of vacant houses in St. Louis, mostly on the north side, um, such as this example right here. We know that there's incredible differences in soil lead levels across the city and differences in road speed and access. For example, this is a private community within the city of St. Louis. So you are not allowed to access this area um, unless you live on this street. And this diverts traffic and changes road speeds 
and pushes traffic onto certain area in onto a more a busier street that thus is getting way more traffic because they have these road barriers. These road barriers are found all over St. Louis, particularly in places where the white and black population are butting up against each other. For those of you that are keen on history, you might notice this house. This is actually the McCloskey's house. They are the people that brought out guns during the Black Lives Matter protest because they were upset um, that people were walking near their neighborhood uh, protesting in support of Black Lives Matter. So this street is actually, this is about two blocks from my apartment building and is right in the center of St. Louis which was context that I never quite got from the, the historic or the, the news articles that were coming out when that happened. So all these different things that are kind of happening because of social policy and historic policy within St. Louis are inf influencing the ecology and evolution of organisms. And oh, let's see. So I decided to look at squirrels. Squirrels are all over St. Louis, as they are in New York, and they seem like this really great study system. These squirrels are native to North America. It's the Eastern gray squirrel. They come in multiple color morphs. You might see the black squirrels in New York and just the massive differences in color. They nest in trees, but they'll also nest in uh, in anthropogenic surfaces, such as in this car. You can imagine if there's vacant houses around that that's a great spot to nest. Uh, in my old biology building, we had one nesting in the main lecture hall. Um, and then they're also incredibly common in urban and suburban parks. Uh, you can see them feeding in the trash cans and they're actually across St. Louis, we see them feeding in the dumpsters. And so I'm asking questions here in my postdoctoral project about a bunch of different things, both adaptive and non-adaptive evolution. So kind of thinking back to my pigeon project, asking how do these landscape, how does where the road barriers are, how does that influence where the squirrels are going because they can no longer cross these roads that have heavier traffic. I'm also asking questions about how they're using the urban space. You can see here, this is in my old building in Inwood, New York, where the squirrels are choosing to nest in between the buildings instead of in a tree, because this is such a safer place. They just have to navigate getting up this drainage pipe. And where they're using urban surfaces, such as fences, to move across, how might their, their limbs change? Like we saw in those lizards, how might their ability to grab and claw onto things change because they're climbing up a fence pipe, they're a, a drainage pipe instead of something like a tree. And then how is their diet changing? This is the maybe famous, infamous Shake Shack Squirrel filmed in Madison Square Park, taking um, one of these Shake Shack cups out of the trash can and drinking the leftover milkshake. So how are, are things like where we're disposing of our trash, how we're disposing of our trash, influencing the uh, evolution of these squirrels? Now, sadly, I'm just at the beginning of my postdoc, but I have a wonderful team of students that are collecting these data we're collecting morphometric data, so limb length to see if their limbs are gonna get longer, head width to see if their jaw and um, shape changes because they have different foods that they're eating in the dumpsters in different areas. We're taking pictures of their claws, as you can see here, to try to understand how their claw shape might change in more urban areas and based on what surfaces they're climbing on. We're collecting feces, a glorious job. Um, looking at microbiome and diet. We're also collecting hair for diet and stable isotope analysis. We're collecting blood to look at viruses and do virus discovery. We're looking at ectoparasites to see if those change across, um, across the Delmar divide. And also pelage photos, looking at their fur coloration on their back and on their front 
to see if that changes. And we're doing this not only across the North South St. Louis, where we get that socioeconomic and racial divide, but also as we move from downtown St. Louis all the way out to the suburbs and even the rural area. So hopefully we'll be able to answer questions about how urbanization and socioeconomics really influences the evolutionary ecology of these organisms. But with that, you're going to have to stay tuned because I don't have those data yet. We're just getting them in this summer. Um, but you can follow me on Twitter or Instagram or check out my website at elizabethcarlin.com. And if you're really interested in this urban stuff, as I assume y'all are, um, I'm just gonna give a little plug for the blog that I run, which is Urban Evolution, L-I-T-C, or Life in the City. You can follow us on Twitter or search Urban Evolution, Life in the City. And we post about recent articles that are happening, things that are happening um, all across the world uh, that relates to urban evolution and ecology. And I am happy to turn things over to Gabriel now um, and answer your questions if you put them in the Q&A box. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Carlin. Um, yes, you uh, all may notice I'm in a, a, a somewhat familiar looking setting because um, <laughs> we're all hanging out with President Rochelle in her apartment. Um, yes, so if anybody has any questions, please uh, type them in the Q&A. You'll find that at the bottom of your screen. You click on that and you can type some questions. Um, and again, thank you, Dr. Carlin, for uh, a fascinating talk with a uh, subject matter that's very near and dear to my heart, namely uh, urban evolution and commensalism, which is one of my favorite topics. I frequently discuss commensalism on my tours and talks. Um, but um, uh, most importantly, uh, I think this is the, the first order of business. Uh, I know you, because again, since we are hanging out in the same apartment, I know um, that you have an adorable little dog. By the way, you're. Uh, your feet are on the screen. Um, an adorable little fluffy dog named Finn. And can, is Finn nearby? Can we can we see Finn? Finn, can Finn can make a cameo appearance? Let me go get him. Hold on. Get Finn, and I'll uh, I'll I'll review the questions here. Okay, we do have a couple questions going in, coming in. But I'll I'll uh, I'll give you all a little more time to uh, to type in your questions while Dr. Carlin gets. There we go. There is he's so cute. He's so well behaved. You probably didn't. <laughs> No, he was here, but here he hear is. Him. Look at his little paws. Oh, hi, Ben. And he hi, he's kind of a doctor too. He helped me write my dissertation. He was with <laughs> me through all of it. And now at WashU, he actually teaches, um, co-teaches a biology of dog breeds class. So if you know freshmen at WashU, they can take a class all about dogs and Finn makes an appearance. Amazing. Oh, wow. Okay. That's incredible. So, um, so, so uh, Professor Finn, I guess we should yes. call him. Okay. Excuse me. Sorry, Professor Finn. Thank you. Um, if anybody has any questions for uh, Professor Finn as well, that's, that's uh, fine too. Um, well, here, here, our first questions are coming in. Um, uh, one asks, uh, how many uh, years would it take, this says millions of years, but I'm guessing given the existence of, uh, would it take before squirrels learn to avoid cars like feral cats do? And now that given that cars have only been around for a hundred years or so, I, um, I, I guess it's a shorter time frame. I, 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 that's a good question. Are they already, have they learned about cars? I'm thinking in certain areas they have. And my hypothesis about that is based on just knowing that uh, in areas with high traffic flow, I see a lot less squirrel roadkill. I am that person that is picking up squirrel roadkill basically wherever I can see it. My postdoc advisor texted me this morning about some roadkill. I think he forgot that I'm not in St. Louis right now, but I get pictures and dropped pins of roadkill all across St. Louis. And actually when I was here in New York, I was getting it for New York City as well. And, uh, I think, I think that they're probably already learning. And even if they're not, that we might see some selection based on that, um, on their ability to more speedily cross the road or not. And so 
again, this is one of those areas, all this kind of urban evolution stuff, I'm so shocked that people are not studying this already. But really, if we could get counts of walking the same area every single day, perhaps around Washington Square Park, right? Looking for the amount of roadkill, if that happens, maybe they're not leaving the park. What's the point of leaving the park? Yeah. Um, you know, if you're, you're not quite sure. I think that there's definitely going to be some behavioral things that happen, like learning, um, and then also possibly some morphometrical, morphometric shifts that happen where maybe they get longer limbs so they can cross that street faster. Um, mm -hmm. Or maybe they're learning to not stop, which they always seem to do in the middle yeah. and try to decide which direction they could go. <laughs> yes, yeah. exactly like that. It seems like a missed opportunity to study urban frogs crossing streets and have like a frogger hypothesis or something. Right, like that is right. Like There's a lot of questions to be answered here. And I can't wait till I have a lab with undergraduate students that will be willing to go out every single day and check the same road. Um, for roadkill. Have you ever, have you read the, read any of the work of Baron Heinrich? Uh, I don't think so. An excellent writer. He's a very, he's, he's kind of that rare uh, beast, which is a, a, a working scientist and, and, and professor, but also very good popular writer and he even illustrates his own books. He did um, uh, Winter World, Summer World, uh, The Snoring Bird, One Man's Owl, a bunch of different, he taught at UVM uh, in Vermont and, but anyway, he also would collect roadkill and do research on it, but if it was fresh enough, he would also cook it and he would write about that. So it's another angle recipes uh, on the roadkill. Um, Let me stop sharing my screen. There we go. Oh, look at that. Okay. Uh, look at yeah. that. So we need some more roadkill inspiration. Check out some of Baron Heinrich's work. He's a ultra marathoner too. So he would like go running and then spot roadkill. And he had some questions about like, uh, he did um, Ravens in Winter and Mind of the Raven. So he did a lot of Corvid research and he would study, I think, some of how they would collect roadkill, uh, which is pretty interesting. Um, yeah, the only downside is uh, the ice in my freezer constantly smells of dead squirrels because <laughs> I'm like in the middle of things and have to go pick up this squirrel and then get race back home to deal with the dog or whatever it is. Well, I hear you. Yeah, um, hey, at least, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, well, you know, it's harder when you have roommates. I, I used to have a roommate <laughs> who... Um, found my bag of dead birds in the freezer and kind of freaked out. And I was like, look, you're preparing raw chicken on a cutting board. That's a lot more of a risk than my little bird collection over here, which is for science. He didn't really get it. But anyway, yeah. that was a long time ago. Um, so we have another question here. Uh, I did have to get rid of my bird collection, though. I, I donated it to Paul, actually, uh, uh, Paul Sweet at the Museum of Natural yeah. History. Um, but I was a little sad about that. Uh, we have a question, which two questions, actually, two in one, which is, is differentiation among cities based on distance or on population density. Now, I don't know, I assume that means of the, of the subject creature, not the human population density. Um, and I think there's some typos here, so it's a bit hard for me to read. Uh, yeah, I'm having some struggle. Str uh, uh, I'm uh, also struggling. Um, uh, but, but anyway, the see. first part is clear. Yeah. Hey, Doug. Um, so differentiation among cities is based on genetic differentiation. I know that you're an evolutionary biologist, so <laughs> may have used your textbook, um, <laughs> may have your textbook on my shelf right now. Um, so it was genetic, um, genetic distance uh, for the pigeons and differentiation among the cities within the Northeastern megacity was based on kind of um, what humans are defining as these cities. So again, it becomes kind of complicated permitting across like eight or nine states um, has been intense. Um, and so the differentiation, we saw genetic relatedness very similar across uh, Boston and Providence and then New York to DC. Um, I'm not quite sure what else is asking, but you can clarify in the, in the comments in the Q&A. Now I had a question on these Rochelle's glasses here to look 
Uh, um, now you mentioned a uh, Shake Shack squirrel. And I, I had a squirrel down in, in the battery a couple of years ago, which I tried to get to go viral. I thought maybe I'd get rich off a squirrel. It didn't happen. I thought it'd be the next pizza rat, but it was churro squirrel. It was a squirrel that was uh, stealing churros from a churro vendor and then sort of had them like a cigar in its mouth. Those churros are so good. How oh, good. And so I, I get it. Um, and I saw this more than once. The churro squirrel, it was like a habit. I, I saw it get, you know, catch several churros. Um, and I'm curious, has anybody done these studies on like, because to like a Shake Shack shake, also very good. Um, really good. Uh, they, have, they have the concretes too. I don't know if it was a concrete or a shake, but uh, I don't know, is that patented? Is that just the Shake Shack thing? Anyway, uh, yeah. No. No? no, it's a regional thing. Anyway, um, high sugar content, right? Like I'm thinking, this is my question. Uh, churros, Shake Shack shakes, not something they would have been feeding on uh, historically in their evolutionary history, more acorns, uh, maybe the occasional fruit. Um, has anybody done any studies on how they metabolize sugars? Like, is there squirrel diabetes? Because uh, there's a lot more, you know, available sugars in junk food that they're eating and raccoons. Yeah. Is that ever yeah. Been? So, and so there's a, some interesting questions that can be asked there that I know of. Nobody is studying urban squirrel blood glucose levels. We uh -huh. can use a, <laughs> you look so smart there. Um we can use a handheld blood glucose monitor, like the kind that you get at Dwayne Reed or CVS to okay. test the blood glucose levels. And we're doing this in the squirrels across St. Louis. You are, yes. Um, yeah. And just seeing wildly varying rates of blood glucose. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that could play into this, how long they've been in the trap, um, what they've eaten earlier that day. So a bunch of different things could be going on there, but it's definitely something that we're interested in looking at. Um, and then the other kind of great thing about this, this squirrel system is that these squirrels, unfortunately, were introduced into Europe, but the European diet is very different than the North American diet. Our North American diet is heavy in sugars and very heavy in corn sugars. We feed our meat corn. Like there is just so much um, and that is different among our diets. And so we're, um, there's a potential there to do cross continent comparisons yeah. where the, the basic food items that these squirrels have had access to for the past 10, 15, 20 years are very different. Right, in Europe, instead of Shake Shack squirrel, you have like pate squirrel and uh, gouda mm. squirrel. Yeah, yeah, the baguette squirrel. Baguette squirrel, yeah, croissant squirrel. Yeah, that makes mm -hmm. sense. I did, you know, I, in I was in Amsterdam once, and the gray herons, which are the European equivalent of great blue herons, this surprised me because I've never seen this with great blue herons. But I guess the herons there maybe have had more time to adapt to urban settings because the cities there are older. Um, the gray herons, at least in Amsterdam, would come in. Uh, there's all these street markets and they would sell a lot of cheese like chowda and the gray herons would come in and pick up discarded uh, pieces of cheese and I saw this multiple times and I've never seen a great blue heron uh, taking uh, advantage of that food source so cheese loving herons in Europe might yeah. be yeah I possible. wonder if they're if the great blues would do it if they were more tolerant of humans right yeah they're they're really the gray herons are really an urban bird and some other things that I don't think of as really urban, like uh, coots. Coots are in all the uh, canals in Amsterdam. There's a lot of waterways. So they're just, a, yeah. they're, like, they're like pigeons almost. They're all over the place. Okay, yeah. but I digress. Uh, let's see some more questions here. Um, uh, do the barriers of roads, et cetera, impact inbreeding? Yeah, so that's absolutely one of the questions that we have. Um, and, and something that we're hoping to find out by doing genetic analysis on these squirrels. We're, we're taking tissue samples um, so we can find out how closely related these individuals are um, and if there's an impact of inbreeding. So we don't know yet. Um, oddly, with the pigeons, we did look into inbreeding and despite what other studies showed, we did not find higher incidence of inbreeding within flocks. We actually found that flocks were not really highly related to each other, hmm. which surprised me. I was kind of expecting a flock of pigeons to all be related to each other, siblings, cousins, aunts, uncles. Um, so very, very surprised by that. 
Hmm. Right. You find that with some birds like Canada geese, the flocks are usually family. Uh, yeah. Well, but not less so with pigeons. Okay. Speaking of pigeons, we have a question here uh, along those lines. Would pigeons from, say, Baltimore and Boston associate with each other and possibly mate if they were put together? Uh, yes, the biological species concept. <laughs> Favorite. <laughs> And so, yes, absolutely, they are absolutely the same species. If you put them together, totally going to mate. What we're seeing now is just kind of background traces of the fact that they haven't been moving back and forth um, for a while. So we're getting these background traces. But same, same species absolutely would mate. You take a pigeon anywhere from the United States, any New York pigeon and bring that anywhere in the world. And it's going to be able to mate with the other um, Columba Livia, which is the, the domesticated pigeon um, anywhere else in the world. And that's a factor of what's known as genetic, genetic drift, right? So is that correct? So like in theory, if you give it enough time, a pigeon from Europe and the US, because there's probably not much crossing happening. Ge yeah, there's not gene flow, gene flow. exactly. Right. They yeah. would have that genetic differentiation, that genetic drift. Right. But it hasn't been, and maybe even Boston and Baltimore, although there may be enough gene flow there that that would never happen. I guess we don't know really probably, right? Yeah. 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 Um, cool. Yeah. I mean, that is how, right, pigeons are kind of a weird example because humans spread them all over the world and that, well, Europeans mostly spread them all over the world. And that just happened within the last 500 years, which yeah. is yeah. time for that genetic differentiation yeah colonizers brought them all over they're quite tasty i highly recommend uh that Never. you try it um it is on menus as squab um uh -huh. but it has a very rich almost steak-like taste mm -hmm. to it we're just getting hungry we're gonna yeah we're gonna get tacos after this <laughs> squab tacos speaking of how delicious pigeons are um how would the pigeons know uh, to have a different FID? And, and um, now remind us again what that stood for. Flight uh, initiation distance. Distance, yes. Depending on whether the local predator is a peregrine falcon, red-tailed hawk, which agree that pigeons are delicious. Yeah, how would they have <laughs> that uh, awareness? Yeah, so I'm not quite sure. And you've been thinking about how to test this idea. Um, but my my guess is if they they know the area because that's their their normal home range right where they're kind of traveling about that they know what predators are in that area and are kind of using that as part of their um, their behavioral response. So there are you know ways that you can test this, move common garden experiments, moving individuals back and forth. Um, and we have, at one point, I was looking up if I could get all the free mannequins from New York City, but then I decided it would be really creepy to have like 20, you know, store mannequins that people were throwing away in my apartment. But the idea being that maybe we could set those up in a parking lot with different predators around and if see if pigeons are using these, these people as cover. I, I think you should definitely do that. Um, but you're going to volunteer your apartment for me to store these in, right? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm already storing a bunch of donated books for the Linnaean Society there. So I'll just add those to my, uh, my storage space. Um, you know, actually there's a woman who makes felt pigeon dolls and sells oh, them. Yeah. There, you, you're familiar. And she'll sit around with all these felt pigeons. And I, I do notice often real live pigeons walking amongst them. And I wonder if they perceive them as weirdly quiet fellow pigeons if maybe they provide cover or if they don't even realize that they're pigeon like at all it's it's i i think about that you, you know you've seen that before yeah and you actually know. one of the things that pigeon hunters will do is put out fake decoy pigeons as a way of of drawing more pigeons in so they may see that as a fellow just very quiet mysterious stranger yeah. okay yeah um uh, another question here, uh, uh, this uh, a viewer says that that was fascinating. And how do you expect toxins uh, in areas, for example, where lead levels are higher to affect? So I guess this ties into the, the environmental racism question. You did hint that there was some 
ways this impacted wildlife. And I, I was also curious to expand on that. Yeah, how would you affect those yeah. lead levels and other toxins to affect populations of wildlife and their behaviors? So um, thanks to the great work of the Wild Bird Fund, Rita McMahon, we know that there is lots of lead level poisoning going on in pigeons. And this can cause these neuro, I think the dog wants to get into your room. <laughs> um, I, <laughs> these can cause a bunch of neurotoxicity problems, right? Where they're just having a hard time navigating at, oh, there he goes. <laughs> There he is. <laughs> um, where they can just have a hard time navigating, flying. You know, lead poisoning is is incredibly harmful for humans, and we can imagine the same for wildlife. Um, and and a great researcher who is now at UC Davis was at Barnard showed that pigeons can be used as kind of this bio indicator. We know that if pigeons in an area have lots of lead poisoning, we can start to check uh, humans for lead poisoning. And yep, there's my dog trying to nest on the bed. <laughs> uh, this, is, this is more entertaining than most of our uh, Q and A's with the added uh, dog uh, content. Uh, uh, okay, uh, let's see here. Next question. Uh, yes, hi Finn. Um, hi, uh, are you, uh, gathering any data on adaptive behavior from birders. Um, crowdsource incidents might suggest areas worthy of study by professionals. Well, I guess you did mention eBird and that's a community science project. Yeah, so I'm writing a paper about this right now. And cool. one of the things that I found when I started looking into eBird data, not necessarily in New York, Mm -hmm. but definitely in places like St. Louis uh -huh. was that the eBird data actually tracks <laughs> uh -huh. the, um, the racial patterns. And so we don't have great participatory science data like iNaturalist and eBird data from a lot of the um, black and poor communities. And so this, this paper is still being written, but it's something that I'm thinking a lot about and thinking about how to, if I'm designing um, these community science projects, I really want to design them with the community in mind in terms of what questions does the community want answered um, and, and how can I go about helping them answer these questions. It is not my place as a scientist to parachute in and, and dictate what needs to be done. Um, and, and this is kind of a, something that is a greater conversation that is happening within science right now and something that I'm very excited that's happening. But definitely we, uh, we're thinking about how to incorporate this participatory data um, and crowdsource incidents. You know, I kind of do wish that we had a journal that we could just report these weird things that we see. Um, mm. The Herp Society has these where, you know, what uh, a friend found a sea anemone feeding on a snake. Whoa. And well, I think I so that got, that. yeah, that, yeah. that made it into, you know, that's, that's a note, something that's noteworthy. I think having some kind of journal where we could describe these weird urban things that we've seen um, would be really great. Are you maybe I thinking was, of founding such a journal? Possibly? Sure, with all the free time that I have. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. But, but, you know, something as simple as I was walking home late at night from a bar because that's what we do in New York City. So it was probably like 2 a.m. And I see pigeons out feeding at two o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. What are these pigeons doing? They should not be feeding at this time. Is it that there's so much ambient light? There's so much light at night that might as well go out and feed. Mm -hmm. Is it that they're avoiding these predators? Um, 
you know, those kinds of things. Even with the the 9-11 tribute lights that we had, we know that the peregrine falcons are hunting in those, yes. um, changing this behavior. And, and, you know, how long before the peregrine falcons know this? Or is it cultural? Have you seen the thing about how one orca started wearing a salmon hat in the 1980s? Oh. Wait. And then it... Like it took a dead salmon and put it on its head? Yeah. Okay, yeah. And then it became a fad among the orcas <laughs> to wear a dead salmon hat. Wow. So that's culture, basically. <laughs> that's culture. So what what is behavioral? What is cultural? What are they learning? Um, and what is adaptive? You know, behavior is so plastic as a trait mm. that, you know, maybe I think we're going to need a lot of data and a lot of observations before we can start to draw conclusions. So if the Linnaean Society of New York wants to start a journal for urban observations in New York, uh, but I'm saying journal? specifically for these urban observations. Fair enough. Uh, I guess our journal might feature more urban observations than some perhaps, but that, that, that yeah, maybe, maybe, uh, yeah, maybe the next issue we'll, we'll focus on that. Well, I think there is a couple, several more questions, but given the hour, I think uh, we should probably wrap it up. Um, okay, there's one last we'll question here we'll that I'm gonna answer. answer. Okay, great. It's true or false, feeding pigeons in an urban setting is a bad idea. And I'm gonna go with true. It is a terrible idea to feed wildlife, that wildlife can feed on their own and we have no need to, to supplement this wildlife food. If you really want that connection with that urban animal, you're really just dying to connect with them. Um, go out birding, join the Linnaean Society, um, go out birding, go out and do some observations. Uh, but please, please do not feed wildlife. Well, fantastic. I think that's a great note to end on, a little PSA. And thank you so much, Dr. Carlin. That was a uh, a really illuminating and, and fascinating uh, uh, talk. And um, I hope everybody will come back next month for October's talk. We'll feature uh, Annie Novak talking about, I believe, an uh, upcoming book she's working on about nocturnal migration. So we kind of talked a little about nocturnal migration tonight, um, the Tribune Lights, for example. And uh, Annie Novak will be here to dive into that uh, in greater detail next month. So. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Carlin. Thank you so much to everybody for joining tonight. Um, I think, should I sign us off? Yeah, okay. I will adjourn the meeting on behalf of myself and uh, President Rochelle and the, uh, the whole Linnaean Society of New York. So thank you so much, Dr. Carlin, and good night, everybody.